Okay, uh, after the short break, we have Nikita Poliansky from Technical University of Munich um, in Germany, and uh, he's going to tell us how to guess an n-digit number. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so uh, my today's talk is based on joint work with Zilin Chan. And uh, if, okay, let, let me start with just a short introduction. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're gonna consider such a problem. Suppose that we have just two players, say Alice, and Alice conceals or designs some um, n-digit number, x1 to xn, such that all digits are in base Q, so they belong to some Curie alphabet. And Bob tries to guess this number by asking questions. So each question is again an n-digit number, y1 to yn in base Q, and uh, so Bob asks this question and he tries to learn how far or how close this guess is fr uh, from X. And as a result, as an answer, he receives the distance between vector X and vector Y. So basically the Hamming distance between these two vectors is just the number of positions I such that XI is different from yi. And Bob's goal is to design a set of numbers and digit numbers such that if Bob asks all of them at once, all these questions at once, then based on the vector of distances, it's possible to uniquely reconstruct, uniquely identify the hidden number x. So if it's possible, if it's possible, if b satisfies this property, then b is called a base. So basically, if b can be used for this identification problem, reconstruction problem, then b is called a base of the Curie and dimensional Hamming space. So we use all these buzzwords just uh, because we deal indeed with Curie and dimensional Hamming space. Okay, and uh, the question of interest is, is always to minimize the cardinality of some structure. In this case, we want to minimize uh, our base. And in this talk, I will mainly focus on this regime when we fix Q, the alphabet, and let n tend to infinity. I know that there are certain papers devoted to some other regimes, but the result that I'll touch upon today also works for the regime when Q is allowed to grow slowly. So basically, if Q is sub polynomial in N, then I believe uh, our results are still valid. Okay, and now let's talk about a few related concepts. The first one is uh, connected to the coin vein problem. And in this problem, uh, we have just a set of coins. Say we have n coins such that some of them are false, some of them are true, but we actually, when we see all these coins, then we don't see any difference between them. And our goal is to identify which coins are false, which coins are true. And uh, what, we, what can we do? We can just take some subset of coins, put this subset of coins on the accurate scale and see the total weight of the chosen group of coins. And our goal is again to minimize the number of coins such that we are able to uniquely reconstruct the set of say true coins. And uh, in this problem, we know the weight of all true coins and let's say that it's A and we also know the weight of all false coins, say it's B. And 
uh, without loss of generality, we can assume that A is one and B is zero, for example, just because the problem is additive. And if we just, the previous problems, the original problems that I stated is actually reconstruction problem. So we have some, say, binary vector of length sand, and we want to identify this vector based on the vector of distances from X to a, uh, vectors from a base. But this problem can be also uh, formulated in this way. Basically, in this problem, we also have a hidden vector X, binary vector X, and we want to construct a set of vectors of lengths and binary vectors of lengths and such that the hidden vector X can be uniquely reconstructed by the vector of inner products between X and vectors from like analog of base. So these problems are like strongly connected because the inner product can be written as uh, the distance between uh, two vectors and uh, basically if we have additional weighing and we have some strategy for the guessing number problem then we can provide solution for the coin weighing problem and it works vice versa okay and uh, for this problem it's known that Nikita, can I ask a quick question? So in both cases, you are thinking of the non-adaptive case, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. Right, but uh, okay, uh, maybe uh, at some point I'll mention just what one can get if we have some level of adaptivity. Okay, uh, for this uh, coin weighing problem, it's known that the minimal number of weighing is at least to n over log n. And this was proved by slightly different methods by Erdős, Ringy, Moser, Pippinger. And uh, I will uh, talk about uh, the methods suggested by Erdős and Ringy. It's like more theoretical. Uh, it's like, I would say the classical information theory method. Uh, as for the constructions, uh, just the same construction was rediscovered by several groups of authors. And it's interesting that for this type of problem, it's possible to uh, find just the asymptotic behavior of this quantity. And, but uh, like Lindstrom, I believe that Lindstrom first uh, found this construction and uh, I, I, uh, again, this construction can be phrased in, in slightly different languages and we will use uh, the language of Möbius functions to present this construction. Okay, and now let's just talk about the cure case and this, uh, case is or, uh, or already connected to the so-called mastermind game. In this game, we have again two players. And uh, so one player, say code maker, creates some sequence of colorful packs and hides it somewhere. And another player tries to guess this sequence of colorful packs by asking a question. So each question is again, some sequence of colorful packs and as uh, I mean as an answer the code breaker receives I mean some information and uh, he receives the Hamming distance between these two sequences and some additional information so let me just skip these details so, so but uh, the main thing here is that the mastermind game is adaptive game it means that after asking first question, the code breaker can just think a bit and uh, just design some next, uh, next sequence of, of 
colorful packs. So this game is adaptive and the question of interest, what is the minimal number of questions required or sufficient to find the hidden sequence. And again, the, uh, the original mastermind game is about some specific case when Q is six and N is four. And this is also an adaptive game. Uh, the study of the non-adaptive non mastermind game was initiated by Fatal. And what was known up to our paper is, uh, again, Kvatyansky et al. showed that it's possible to generalize uh, erdrich renyi arguments, and they show that this metric dimension is at least to n over log n. This log n is in base q already. Uh, as for constructions, uh, Kabatyansky and Lebedev showed that this problem for some small q can be reduced to another concept introduced by Lindstrom. As far as I remember, it's called uh, detecting matrices or resolvable matrices. But for larger Q, it's no longer possible to show this reduction, as far as I know. And the main contribution of our work is that we showed that uh, it's possible to find the asymptotic behavior of this quantity for all Q. And additionally, just as a, a side contribution, we just uh, generalize this problem a bit and consider the metric dimension of graph that can be represented as a Cartesian power of a given connected graph. Just because the Hamming graph is just uh, the Cartesian and power of complete graph. So, but we, uh, I mean, in, in our generaliz generalization, we allow uh, uh, we just take an arbitrary connected graph and consider the nth Cartesian power of this graph. Okay, now let's talk about uh, lower bound, the converse result. So uh, this result follows from, uh, as I said, some typical information theory arguments. And let's take some point in our base why? Uh, if you measure a distance between this point and any point in the space, then the distance between these two points is some integer between zero and n. So in, in a sense, we, uh, by uh, asking a distance between hidden point and point from the base, we get, in, in a sense, uh, log at most uh, log of n plus one bits of information. Okay, uh, but if we take uh, our point randomly and measure distance between y and our random point, then uh, the distance is somehow concentrated around the average distance, which is just q minus one over q times n in this case. And now we're going to define the set of points at distance close to the average distance and how close just take uh, this range square root of n log n approximately times possibly some constant so as you can see that uh, what we can prove here is that this set has to be large if we take a proper constant in front of constant uh, in front of this square root of n log n. And moreover, if we just take the intersection between uh, all these AYs where Y run over optimal size B, base B, then the cardinality of this intersection has to be again large. If we can play with some constants. And now we're gonna define the map from this set A to vectors, uh, vector of distances. Since uh, B is a base, then this map has to be injective. And this means that uh, 
the cardinality of the image has to be at least uh, the size of A. And from these arguments, we just can literally obtain the bound that I mentioned here. Okay, and now let's talk about a more interesting point in our work, it's construction. So I'll give uh, some important points that we use in our constructions. First of all, let us consider uh, the set of natural numbers, including zero, and let us define the partial order over this set. So we say that uh, an integer j is at most i by this partial order if j is i bitwise and j. So for example, if uh, we can see that four is smaller than five by this partial order, just because four looks like one zero zero, five is one zero one, but uh, we don't, uh, we can say that three is smaller than five by this partial order. And now we're gonna define the Mobius function of two variables. Uh, basically, since we have a post set, then we can define this Mobius function in a recursive way. So basically, if two arguments are the same, then it's one. If uh, j is smaller than by, uh, if j is smaller than i by the partial order, then it's defined as this sum. In all other cases, it's zero. And since we are given with some specific partial order, we can just compute this Mobius function and get that it looks like this, this minus one to the power weight of j minus weight of i, where weight is just the number of ones in the binary representation of an integer. Okay, and now we're gonna construct our base. Let's say that we have n plus one vectors in our base and let's put them at, as rows in our matrix Y. So basically we have n plus one rows in this matrix and the number of columns is basically a function of M uh, which will be specified shortly. And somehow we're gonna construct this matrix not row wise, but we're gonna construct it in column wise manner. And let's first partition our matrix into n plus one submatrices such that the i submatrix has this amount of columns, weight of i over log of q. Uh, this is definitely not necessarily an integer, but uh, we definitely need to make some, uh, take some floor operation, possibly deduct some constant, but let's uh, omit these details. Okay, and now we're gonna, uh, so we actually require just two properties from this submatrix. And I'm gonna list them and possibly I'll uh, skip some details. Uh, so let's say that we have two parameters, J runs over all possible rows. So this is an integer between zero and M and key is uh, the index of column. So it's an integer between zero and weight of I over log Q. Uh, we want to treat so we're gonna put, uh, so all our vectors in our base should be just n digit numbers or just elements of the n dimensional chemic space. Uh, let us label elements of the complete graph as V1, V2 and VQ. So, and just, we can treat elements of uh, our alphabet 0, 1 to Q minus one as some formal variables, V1 to VQ. And we actually require some formal property from this matrix. Before 
we define our first property, we're gonna set some integers to be elements of some arithmetic progression. So the first property looks like that. So we're gonna take some linear combination of entries in the keys column of this submatrix. And uh, so we run over all J's, which are at most I by the partial order and take linear combination of the corresponding entries with coefficients, which are values of the Mobius function. I claim that we can actually fulfill this property if key, the number of columns is not very large. So uh, let's take on the left-hand side, we can see that in total, we have like this amount of terms. Okay, let, let me just skip some details here. I claim that if key is not very large, then we can actually fulfill this property. And if you need this prop, uh, if you want to have this equality, then uh, we need to set only J's such that J is at most I by the partial order. For all J's, which are not smaller than I by the partial order, we define entries by this formula. So this is quite important for for us just because we're gonna use the second property. The second property looks like that. So it's similar to the first one. So basically it's a similar expression, but we're gonna run, uh, so the index I here, so this is about sub matrices, which are located to the left with respect to this matrix. And somehow this property is implied by Lindstrom lemma for mid semilattices. And this property is fulfilled just because we require uh, this property, just because we define our matrix in some special way. Okay, and now I, I'm going to just talk a bit how we're gonna decode how we're going to uncover our hidden vector. So let's say that we have some hidden vector x and let's partition it into m plus one pieces such that the length of the i piece corresponds to the number of columns in the of the i submatrix. And based on the vector of distances d0 to dm, we are going to reconstruct our hidden vector x. And we're going to do it from right to left. And uh, to this end, we actually gonna take some specific linear combination uh, over distances. So basically we take some linear combination of distances with coefficients which are values of the Möbius function. And the second argument here is just M because it, it just corresponds to the last piece. And somehow, because we require just two properties that I mentioned on the previous slides, we can prove that this linear combination is basically a function of the last part of our vector X. Moreover, this uh, okay, this is basically some integer that we can compute. And it's possible to prove that this integer is also looks like that. And somehow we can reconstruct uh, the last part of our vector X, just because this expression looks like a Curie expansion of this integer D sub N. And we're gonna continue in a similar way and consider this linear combination. So basically here, it's a similar expression, but the second argument of the Möbius function is M minus one. And it's possible to prove that uh, this is a function that depends only on the last two parts of our hidden vector X. 
And this means since we already uncovered the last part, it's possible to extract also the previous part. And we continue in the same way. Now, let me just shortly talk about slightly more general problem uh, because uh, the same a similar methodology can be applied for a more general problem. So now let us consider just uh, some arbitrary graph G. Uh, we say that a subset of vertices is a base of this graph if uh, any vertex in the graph can be uniquely reconstructed by the vector of distances. Okay, and it's again interesting to find the minimal size of a base for a given graph G. But we're gonna, cons uh, we're gonna consider the Cartesian n powers of a given connected graph G, and we uh, want to find the asymptotic behavior of the metric dimension of the Cartesian n power of this connected graph G. So basically fix graph G and let N tend to infinity. So our main like structural result looks like that. If uh, some certain property on uh, distance matrix of this graph G holds true, so if this matrix is invertible, then it's possible to say that the metric dimension is asymptotically to n over log n in base q, where q is just the number of vertices. And we can actually examine some classes of graphs. For example, if G is a complete graph, this corresponds to the Curie Hamming space. Uh, if G is a pass cycle or complete by path graph on Q versus, then the asymptotic is exactly as I said, for just the Curie and dimensional Hamming space. Uh, it's also possible to just run over all possible graphs or uh, say small graphs and try to uh, examine the property I just stated two slides before and uh, we checked and we found that there are some like not counterexamples, but some graphs for which uh, uh, that property is violated. And the smallest graph for which we don't have this property is basically key six minus triangle. Uh, for this graph, we can only say that the, asymptotically the metric dimension is at least uh, two n over log n in base six, and at most two n over log n in base seven. Yes, and that's it. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, you can just ask me. Yeah, um, let's give uh, Nikita a round of applause, for, uh, applause first. Or hit the reaction button. Uh, yeah, maybe Nikita, you could tell us a bit about the adaptive uh, adaptive case uh, of this problem. Ah, okay, okay. So, so just again by simple naive bound, we can say that the metric dimension. Uh, okay, we can say that this is metric dimension. Yeah, but uh, for say guessing problem the number of questions should be at least n over log n. And as far as I know, this question, uh, this problem is still open. Like there is no better construction than uh, better that uh, is known for the non-adaptive case. And I actually also don't know whether it's possible to improve the converse bound, like n over log n. Is it possible to improve the constant in front of this order of magnitude? 
Okay. Um, is there any other questions? All right. Uh, thank you, Nikita, very much again. Uh, uh, thank you. A round of applause. And uh, uh, yeah. And uh, I guess we will take a four minute break uh, and uh, reconvene uh, soon. Thank you.